Good evening, everyone. Thank you so very much for coming in tonight um, and coming out to hear on this important topic. This is this is um, earth breaking news, late breaking news. Uh, this topic, it's the first of its kind anywhere, anyway, that I, I've been with the city for and I'll go a little bit into that, but I've been with the city for 15 years and I have never myself heard a presentation on homelessness. And those of you who are familiar with Healthy You, um, which I'll talk about in one minute, know that there's very few topics that I shy, shy away from. This is one I've wanted to bring here since Healthy You um, was born three years ago. So I'll briefly go into myself. Here's how the night's gonna go. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's gonna be fast paced, which is cool for you guys because we have three phenomenal presenters all of whom are up, um, up here on the panel. So we've got a lot of material to cover in an hour and a half. We're gonna do our best to keep pace with that. Um, but at the end of the day, my name is Patty Roberts. I'm the deputy director for the city of Port St. Lucie Parks and Recreation Department. And one of the pleasures I've had um, through my 15 years is being able to create and facilitate this program. I facilitate other programs, but this one is near and dear to my heart. And it's Healthy You, we talk about some very tough and sensitive topics. Um, I see some veterans here. <laughs> we have talked about um, depression. We talk about anxiety. We talk about domestic violence. Every year while I'm here, we will talk about the opioid epidemic. Um, that's the genesis for Healthy You in many ways. Is um, It will be five years in August. Uh, my son, 22 years old, Danny Roberts, died right here in Port St. Lucie of a heroin overdose that was laced with fentanyl. And so that's the genesis behind Healthy You and why I firmly believe we have got to talk about these topics. Um, and before I leave that topic, I, I, I would be remiss in saying I miss Danny with every breath I take. So um, thank you for that opportunity to share that. Ergo, why we're, we're here to talk about homelessness. Um, because in my experience and these three subject matter experts, are going to share, in my experience, homelessness is not the root cause um, of the issue that we're having. Um, mental health is, is a huge component of the homeless uh, population, but I will let these three uh, women um, either confirm or deny that. So that's a little bit about myself. Please turn off your cell phones. Also, please um, know that the restrooms at this facility are right out these doors and to the left. Okay, and um, the only the only other thing I would say before we um, break to get food is because I, I didn't say this the last two uh, monthly sessions because of the way that we are recorded here every session of healthy you is recorded and it will be available on the city's website one to two weeks from tonight so to get to that recording you can go to www dot city of PSL dot com forward slash healthy and the letter U. Okay. Um, but every session is recorded. You'll get that one to two weeks on the on the website from tonight. However, because of the way we're set up aud with audio and, and visual, when you guys ask a question tonight, I'll be sitting right here and I will have to repeat back your question. And I'll repeat that question back and then whomever the question is directed at they'll be up here and they will um, respond to your question because otherwise the recording doesn't pick up your question okay so that's kind of the um, um, healthy you in a nutshell and what we're going to do tonight so we're going to move right through all three presentations um, one right after the other and um, I'll, talk, I'll give a brief bio of each of our presenters so you know the quality of speaker that you've got in front of you. But before we do that, I, if I could ask everyone, we have got fr a free light dinner here provided by the city. So please help yourself to uh, dinner. There's um, either soda, iced tea, or water in the back as well. So grab some food and drink and bring it back to your, to your plate and we will get started immediately. How's that? Oh, yeah.
All right, well, a couple people just finished up at the um, with the food and beverage. I hope everyone found the food and, and drink acceptable or um, appetizing. Um, so thank you to the city for that. I do wanna just briefly talk about some upcoming events. Um, the flyers are all in your packet that's on your table. Um, but the next session of Healthy You, which again is mental health, is will be happening in this room um, on March 1st. It's a Wednesday night. That's all Healthy You is Wednesday night. And we're going to talk about adoption. In April, we're going to talk about resilience building, um, also in this room. Then in May, we're going to talk about substance use disorder with alcohol. Now that's a brand new topic that we're bringing. Um, I have never brought that topic because it's not my lived experience, but it is desperately needed in this city. So in June, we're going to talk about bullying, cyberbullying, and internet safety, um, which is a great presentation by our Port St. Lucie Police Department. And then in August, we do it every year, is our opioid epidemic. Um, in September, I'm very excited about the post-traumatic stress disorder presentation that we're going to do. Um, we've got some subject matter experts coming, and we'll also have a panel of veterans who will speak on PTSD. Um, and then Wednesday, October 4th, very excited. Um, the gentleman who's actually going to be facilitating that session is here in the house tonight, Mr. Alan Anter. Um, but that is the only session of Healthy You that will not be held here. That topic is going to be anxiety reduction techniques to use in nature. And that, for me, I'm so excited about that, but we're going to have that one at Botanical Gardens. Does everybody know where that is on Westmoreland Boulevard? Um, and so Mr. Anter is going to take us through the gardens. They're, they're absolutely beautiful. And show us what to, how to manage our anxiety um, when we're in nature. And some of that will ob obviously help you um, in your everyday lives. Um, and then in November, we're going to talk telemental health. And we'll, we'll close out the year in December. We always do typically with depression and, and holiday stress. So those are our healthy use sessions. Um, I've also, like a glutton for punishment, um, started another program. It's actually called Wellness Connection. And we had our session last Thursday night of Wellness Connection, and the topic was um, heart health. And that was held up at the Oxbow Eco Center because we try to get to each district in the city and uh, very well attended. Um, and we had the American Heart Association talking to us about heart health. Um, so the next session of Wellness Connection is in April, and it's going to be on tobacco and vaping cessation. And we've got two SMEs coming out on that. And um, that session will be held on the west side at Minsky Gym. And we'll close out the year um, in July of Wellness Connection, um, speaking on access to health care. Um, I am very fortunate. I work for a great employer and have a great me uh, medical plan. Not everybody has that luxury. So we recognize that we want to provide some help on how to navigate and find some some quality um, health care. So those are just a few a very brief synopsis of what's coming up. The only thing I would ask is for the first 50 people who register for each session, there is a free light dinner like y'all are enjoying tonight, but you must pre register because I have to place the order with the caterer. So go online again to our city's website and choose what session, all sessions that you want to go to. And that way I have an accurate count of what to place with the caterer. So we're going to go ahead and get started unless there's any questions, but enjoy your food. And first of all, um, we're going to have our first presenter. Ms. Kylie Fewer haha, is the district homeless liaison, advocate, mouthpiece, and believer for 2,000 students. Can't believe that number experiencing homelessness within St. Lucie Public Schools, and she's held that role for the last five years. Prior to that, she worked alongside the child welfare team for five years to provide in-home services to the high-risk youth in the community. She serves on several community boards, including Impact 100 of St. Lucie, Council of Social Agencies, and one St. Lucie Community Homelessness Task Force. So without further ado, Ms. Kylie Fewer.
and you just click. For this here? Yep, you should be able to. You change it. He has all the battery. All right. Let me um, start by saying this angle from this laptop camera is phenomenal. I'm really loving this down here. Just, just kidding. It's not, it's not a great angle, but okay. Um, welcome, everybody. I am Kylie Fewer. I work for St. Lucie Public Schools. I am the district homeless liaison. So I run our program that supports uh, students experiencing homelessness that attend any of our schools within the district, within the county. I started five years ago, and we had a little over 600 students identified as experiencing homelessness and we really ramped up our identification strategies and tried to identify all of those that were living in homeless situations and the number has grown astronomically over the last five years so um you'll see the number here so 1920 we had 1400 students uh identified as living in homeless situations 2021 1700 21 22 it jumped up to 2100 and when i pulled these stats for patty like two weeks ago we were already at 2123 which is almost what we ended last year at so um if you're unfamiliar with st lucie public schools we've got 36 schools two alternative sites and nine charter or private schools we also have a bunch of smaller private schools run through churches all that jazz they're not necessarily counted in these numbers because they don't provide me with their numbers. Um, for the public schools, we have over 46,000 students registered at our across our entire district, and um, right over 31,000 of them qualify for free and reduced lunch. So that's 67% of our students in St. Lucie qualify for free and reduced lunch. So that's 67, where their parents um, are below whatever that income threshold is for free and reduced lunch. Okay, clicker does not work. We can go this way. Okay, all right. Third time's charm, right? So, yeah, I want to use the trackpad clicker. Yeah, the arrows did not work, so that's okay. The third thing worked. So McKinney Vento, McKinney who, what is that? Sometimes it's called a backpack program. So McKinney Vento is a federal definition. It's through um, the Department of Education, and that explains what qualifies under DOE, Department of Ed, for homeless. So that's a individual lacking a fixed, regular, and adequate nighttime residence. What are the different categories that make that up? Like who qualifies for that in St. Lucie? Um, that's gonna be your first category is shelters as maybe none of you know, or all of you, I'm not sure where we're at with that, but we don't have a shelter here in St. Lucie County. However, we do have families that were living here, renting a house, attending school here, and they became evicted and they are now forced into one of our surrounding counties to utilize their shelters. So they get counted if they're still attending a public school here, if they're at the Hope for Families in Vero or they're in Compassion House out in Stewart, um, that counts for our, our shelter population if they're attending here. Um, B is doubled up. So that's families living with other families due to economic hardship and they have no other choice. So. Um, for some things, the category for doubled up because they technically have a roof over their head, they don't qualify for other services. They may not qualify because they're not street homeless, but they are families that are living in, you know, a corner of the living room and they're staying there and they are being told when they can leave, when they can go, when they can use the kitchen, when they can use the bathroom by the people that's hosting them. Sometimes it's family, sometimes it's friends, sometimes it's someone they just met. And some of these families are moving from house to house every weekend. So every weekend, I have some of these families calling me, we had to move again. Uh, this is the, where the address we're at now, can you help me set up a bus? They might stay there 10 days, they call me again. Oh, now we're in our car for a little bit. So while yes, they have a roof over their head and they're protected from those uh, weather elements and some of those other things, it is not stable housing. It, if they don't have a name on a bill or a lease and they don't have, they're not paying to live there, th they are considered homeless under the McKinney Vento, the DOE definition. Um, D is street homeless. So that's your families living on 
pontoons that they converted to houseboats, living in tents, they're living in abandoned houses, they're living at the park, they're staying in their car. And then the last category would be uh, in living in hotels due to economic hardship. So the families that are working and they get kicked out or evicted or their landlord sold the house, uh, foreclosure, any of those instances, um, and they end up in a hotel for a little while, they usually ride that out for a bit and then they realize they can't afford that and then they end up in their car or whatnot. Um, usually 75% of our total number, so 75% of that 2100 is doubled up. So they are living with other family and friends um, or strangers that they just met that are willing to give them a little spot in their house. Usually 75% are in that category. The next biggest category is the hotels. We usually have uh, 100, 140 in hotels throughout the year. Um, and then you have the street homeless. And then usually our smallest population is the shelter just because there isn't, if you've got a parent that's living here, a family that's living here and they work here, they're going to school here and they have to go into a shelter in the surrounding counties, a lot of them can't afford to commute back and forth for work. So they'll live in their car in St. Lucie County versus going outside to stay in a shelter. So that's why our shelter number, I think we had a shelter here. It would always be full because I mean, look at our numbers and they'd be more apt to stay there, but they don't want to make that drive, especially if they're working or if they've got two people working in one car, it's just impossible to commute back and forth from out of county. So how does St. Lucie Public Schools identify their homeless students? Um, we do it through new student enrollment. So when a family comes into the student assignment office of the school district, let me back drive. So in St. Lucie, you don't just go to your closest school and sign your kid up for school. You have to come through the district office and go through a centralized enrollment process. It's very different from I hear any other county because people from Miami or Broward, they're like, this is not how we do it there. I just went to the closest school. I don't know. That's not how we do it here. It's been in place before me. So when they come in, a new family moves into the area um, because they got priced out of Palm Beach or they're moving out of Rivard or Polk County or whatever, and they come here you typically have to give the child's birth certificate and two proofs of address. If they don't have two proofs of address because they don't have their own place, then the counselors work with them, they identify them as McKinney Vento, and that's one way they get identified. Also, we send home a questionnaire, a McKinney Vento questionnaire, to all 46,000 students at least one time every school year. Because that helps to identify the families that have been living here and attending school year for a couple of years and they weren't homeless, but now some things have happened and they are. So that form coming home to every single student also helps to kind of identify that. We have social workers, um, open house packets. When they call transportation, they need to update their address. Um, they do it so many times, kind of raise a red flag and transportation will send the family's information to me and I'll call and follow up and kind of see what's going on if they're in transition um, and identify them. And then of course, any of our community partners. So if a family moves into safe space or the Salvation Army shelter, any of the shelters around here, they have my form and they, if they find out they're a St. Lucie kid, they send it right over to me. We set up the transportation. Um, same with like the WIC office, Boys and Girls Club, they're all familiar with the program. So if they're working with a child or a family and they hear about, you know, they may be in one of these uh, situations, they send the referral over to me as well. This is the form. So this is how they refer a family. So a community partner can fill this out, a family can fill this out, a teacher can fill this out, um, whoever. And then it gets either mailed to me, they drop it off, or they email. We have a fax machine, but I mean, I think I get like every other fax that gets sent, so I try not to let people do that. Um, this is just more on doubled up, just because that is our heaviest population. Um, usually it's around 1,800 of the 2,100 are living in another, they're living in a garage, they're living in, you know, seven people in one bedroom, or like I said, like half of the living room. Oh, that was my video that we're going to skip. I was like, I don't know who that kid is. Oh, maybe, maybe we're not going to skip it. Okay. This is a nice little flow chart that helps me and all the schools identify if someone comes in and they say, oh, I'm living with someone, I don't have proofs of address. Sometimes it's by choice because they want to live with the grandparents or it's more of like a cultural norm. So they're used to living multi-generational, then that would not be McKinney Vento. They, you know, if they can afford to live on their own and they're choosing to live doubled up with another family, maybe childcare or something like that, a little more convenience, that would not qualify. So this is just my little cheat sheet for that. Um, so, like I said, it's a federal program, so every school district in the country has the McKinney Vento program, and students that are in a homeless situation, they have these certain rights, 
in any school district in the country. So they have the right to stay in their school of origin. So if they've been attending school over here in St. Lucie West and they have to move in a grandma in Fort Pierce or Bureau or a shelter in Stewart, they can remain at the school that they are attending before they became homeless. We will also transport them back and forth every day so they can have some normalcy in their life, especially for those ones that are moving every week, every other week, every month. I mean, I can't imagine going to 10 different schools in one school year just because I keep moving. So that's something that we do to put in place so the kid has some some normalcy and some stability in their life. Um, they're coded for free breakfast, free lunch within 24 hours. They um, can enroll without the proper documentation. So if they don't have proof of address, um, if they're not homeless, they can't enroll until you have your birth certificate. You gotta have all the documents up front or your kid can't go to school. With these kids, it's better to get them into school. Get them into school and then I work with the parents for 30 days if they need a help getting a copy of the birth certificate, we can do that. And then of course they don't have the proof of address because they don't have a proof of address. So that form that I showed you is all that they need for documentation. Some of the extra things that we do here in St. Lucie, we provide um, any any barrier to education I remove. So if the kid is not going to school because they don't have the collared shirts or underwear or socks or shoes or a backpack or school supplies, I supply it up to three times per year. They can get hygiene items every month. Um, we do a big back to school push. So all the families come in for like an event on a Saturday or before school starts and then get everything they need to get started for school. Um, if there's younger kids in the home and they need diapers or whatever it may be, because unfortunately I get too many families that also have like an infant and they're all living in the car or all living in the hotel, we refer them out to community resources for that. We provide tutoring. So if a student's identified as homeless and they have a C or below in a core subject area, they can get up to 10 hours of tutoring through one of the companies we contract with. That can be online if they have access to a laptop. They'll come to the shelter, they'll come to the hotel, they'll do it at the school, whatever works best for these kids to help get them on track to move on to the next grade. Um, we do referrals to the community, uh, anything that they may need that is not education related, I'll refer out for that. We can pay for aftercare or summer camp, field trip fees, so they can be included in that because you don't want to be the only kid not going to SeaWorld when the rest of your class is going just because your family is in a tough spot. So that's something that the um, program helps out with as well. Um, recertification, I don't, we don't roll any of our families over year to year. So every summer I zero out all of my numbers and close everyone's homeless episode and then they have to recertify. So no one's carrying over for nine years just because they never called and said, hey, I'm not homeless anymore. Everyone gets closed out and then I work all year long to, to get in touch with all of them again because they change numbers so frequently because their phone gets shut off and I don't have an address and it's like I resort to sending out pigeons and then those don't come back and it's just like a whole, it's a whole situation. So they recertify every year. I don't really send out pigeons. These are some of the community partners. So the Treasure Coast Food Bank, they provide a big portion of our hygiene items. Um, little birthday angels, they do birthday bags for 17 of our schools. So at the beginning of the month, I'll send over a report to the birthday angels. They're a nonprofit out of Bureau. And they pack these really nice duffel bags that get delivered to the school and then delivered to the student on the week, sometime during the week of their birthday. It's not always the day of, but you know, we try. Um, Cause, and sometimes that's the only, birthday gift they get is what's in this duffel bag from this awesome nonprofit. Grace Packs, they provide um, weekend food on Friday. It's offered to all of our McKinney Vento students. So they bring it into the school if the family signs up for it and the kid gets to hit, go down to the office on Friday afternoon before they leave. They get like peanut butter, macaroni and cheese, granola bars, like those kind of non-perishables that go home with them for the weekend just to kind of help out. Um, the Lions Club, they do anything I care. So if I have a kid that needs glasses, they don't have insurance, something like that, I refer them there. Um, Barnes Noble donates between three and 6,000 brand new books every December for the holiday book drive. And then I use them to do these holiday bags for the kids. Speaking of which, here's the holiday bags. It's my um, favorite and least favorite project out of the year because it's so much work, as you can tell. Um, but it's books are really important to me and when I heard about this stat down below so in our um, less affluent neighborhoods there is one book to every 13 children and in our more affluent neighborhood neighborhoods there's 300 books to every one child and when you go to a classroom or I speak to some of these groups of kids so many of them don't have any print at home no books there's no books for mom to read or brother this kid has never owned their own book and I was like this is just unheard of to me and that 
reflects so much on their testing scores later and their reading comprehension, their vocabulary, their communication skills, everything can be kind of related back to reading and books and just exposure to print. So that's how it started. Barnes Noble was like, here's 6,000 brand new books. And I was like, well, how do I get these out to the kids now? They don't want just want a book. So now they also get like these other items and it's it's chaos for six weeks, but they love it. After the first year, I had so many kids that came back to me and they're like, I've never had my own book. I've read this so many times because it's mine. I don't have to give it back to the library. It's not tattered from 20 other people having it and then it gets passed down to me. It's something, I. It, it's mine. It was mine to start with and I get to keep it. So unfortunately that's what keeps me going. Um, support for Armacity Vento seniors. So we have a 98% graduation rate for our homeless seniors. So these are students that are defying all odds and still continuing to graduate on time. So they are, some of them are living in their car by themselves. Some of them are homeless with their family, you know, hopping from house to house. Some have to stay with grandma because their parents are out on the streets, um, but they're, they're doing it. They've got the grades, they've got the volunteer hours, whatever it is for graduation. So we pay for the cap and gown fees. Um, it's like 60 to $100, depending on the school. So we go ahead and cover that. If they want to take the ACT or SAT, there's waivers. They don't have to pay the testing fees. I can also supply um, tutoring, or not tutoring, prep materials for that. Um, and then we usually pay any senior fees that they have. Um, how can you help? So I can't reach every one of our 46,000 students. So that's when I talk to community partners and community individuals like yourself with, if you hear, of someone that is in this kind of situation giving them my contact information or if you just remember mckinney something it doesn't or the homeless program of the school district doesn't matter letting them know that that program's out there and then they'll find a way to get a hold of me and then i'll provide whatever support to them that i can to help get them through to graduation because really that's you know i i don't deal with housing i don't cure the homeless like some of these other presenters are going to talk about but i can get you through graduation to which hopefully will set you up to be less likely to continue in that homelessness cycle. Again, this is the form, because this is like the most important part. It's very simple. The families fill it out, whoever. Um, my contact information, I also have a, a one sheeter that I'm gonna give to everyone that has my contact information as well, so pass along to whoever you want. And then I'm gonna conclude with um, being that person so a lot of times these kids go to school and they're scared to talk about what's going on for fear of judgment or if we have these teens that have to leave home because the parents locked them out because they're 18 now but they're still their entire senior year to go um they don't know who to reach out to that's not just going to run back to their parents and tell on them or report them to dcf as a runaway or you know the kid that i try to help our schools look at more when the kid has missed a lot of school and he comes back don't greet him with, where have you been? Where's your note? You've missed 10 days. Greet them with, I'm so glad that you came back. I'm so glad you're here today. So that then if he has to miss school again because something's going on at home, he doesn't have that anxiety coming back that, oh, I don't have a note. How do I explain that we were like in the car for three days? Be that person that he can go to that's happy to see him when he comes back to school. So with that, do you want me to do Q&A for me now or wait for everybody at the end? Okay. All right. So I'm going to, that's it. I'm Kylie Fewer. I'm going to pass out a flyer real quick while she's introducing the next person. If you have any questions, um, I'll be here at the end. Yeah, I'll come up and do your question. Wow. I learned stuff right there that I had no clue. The numbers, Kylie, are are unbelievable. I had no idea. Um, so we will, we'll save the Q&A for each one of these ladies um, until the end. Um, but now next uh, coming to us is a woman named Carol Roberts. No relation to me. <laughs> um, she is the community. Oh, Louise. Oh, my bad. I purposely, I purposely, um, I on purpose um, advanced the slide to see who was next. So uh, we had to consolidate all three present presentations into one. And so that was my error. Um, next, we have um, Louise Hubbard, and she is the founding executive director of the Treasure Coast Homeless Services Council Incorporated. 
Under her leadership and expertise, the first continuum of care for Indian River County was established in 2000, which grew to include St. Lucie and Martin counties with more than 75 members and agencies participating. Now, Ms. Hubbard has a, has a lot of credentials under her name. So if I fail to mention one of these due to brevity, brevity please call it up, okay, when you come up. Um, but the agency that she um, formerly managed, um, the con Continuum of Care, has purchased under her direction um, and owns outright 50 single family homes, which that's cool to me, which are now available as affordable housing rental options for low and moderate income families in the community. Ms. Hubbard serves, served as the president of the statewide Florida Coalition for the Homeless for six years and provided technical assistance to many of the original continuum of care startup programs in Florida. Prior to coming to the continuum of care in the year 2001, 20, 20, Ms. Hubbard was the director of long range planning for the New York State Department of Substance Abuse Services and conducted certificate of need and joint commission program compliance for hospitals in New York and Florida. Louise Hubbard has an MPA from New York University Wagner School of Public Service. So now I'll call up Ms. Hubbard to talk about her experience with the homelessness. Good. Thank you. Okay. Click this one. Okay. This is completely different from that presentation because at this stage in the game, can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. I want to make sure that you see faces, okay? I think it's time for us to recognize a whole different culture of people who has nothing, who has no McKinney Vento, who has no shelter, who has nothing. Okay, and I'm showing you right now, I'm sharing them with you. This is an actual picture. This is David Long, who's Angels of Hope Outreach, okay, Ministries. He goes into the street every day, okay? And we take pictures of people who, are, who will let us who understand why we're doing it, because we want to try to raise awareness. If you look at this picture, this is a woman at a bus stop, dumped, period, end of story. Next, okay, so then, huh? Right, okay, the next one, see this woman? I'm showing you her face, she's allowed us to, and it says, this woman is not typical, of what people consider the homeless. She is severely mentally ill. She has no insurance. And she lives in an encampment in the woods. This woman lives in a camp in the woods. What you have to do is look at this woman to know she has issues that should be addressed. But she lives in a camp in the woods. Next. Here's another one, another pictures we took. This woman was quote unquote released from the hospital to a bus stop. Moments later, she was trespassed. Do you know what trespass means? An officer can arrest you for being on somebody else's property or being where you shouldn't be and you can go to jail. And when you go to jail, you automatically get a record. So it doesn't help you much except maybe you get a hot in a cot for a night. But other than that, in any event, she also has no insurance. And there's nowhere for her to go either. Another face I want to share with you. This is a guy, probably doesn't look like the person that you think is homeless all the time. He also was released from Lawnwood Hospital. And most people still think of homelessness as men only. And he has no insurance either. So he was released in a wheelchair from the hospital. Happens every day. Well, I wanted you to see a different face of homelessness. There are no programs for any of these people. No programs, no money, no nothing. Next. I thought we were supposed to wait till the end. I'd be happy to answer. That's up to her. She's the boss. <laughs> no, she's not. Can are you are you okay with holding that that question? Okay, perfect. Okay, thank you. Because we've got it. You know, we've got a lot of a lot of 
things to go over. So we'll, we'll cover um, this it This is at the short, end. though. I just wanted to show faces, you know? Uh, this is what life looks like in the woods today, okay, for some homeless women. I mean, this is basically not a whole lot different. What is she doing? She's probably in there looking for something that she could use. Or she's trying to, I don't know, we can't figure that out. We couldn't figure it out when we saw her because that lots of times there's not a whole lot of trust going on and you have to establish trust with people. Okay, the next one, these women both live right here during the day, right out in the street, both of them literally live in the street, period. Where are these pictures? Fort, Port St. Lucie in a, in a, you know, and, Port, and Fort Pierce. Yeah, they live here and, it, and that's, that's, that's where they live. They have pets, not uncommon, okay? Here's what usually looks like cold night shelter. You know what cold night shelter is? Cold night shelter is called usually by recreation, not never recreation, but emergency management to accommodate people who will otherwise be in the street at 44 degrees and raining. It is an overnight event. Usually it happens in schools. A lot of schools use it. Some churches do it, but there are places where there is no place for, they, they can't get to it. There's no transportation to it. They're disabled and can't walk, a million reasons. And so this is, this is a standard, standard cold night shelter. You know what, it, it's a bus stop, okay? There's a lot of places where you'll find more of this, but we're fortunate yet so far in Port St. Lucie and St. Lucie County, you don't see as much, but it's everywhere. It's just still kind of kept down a little bit, let's put it that way. <laughs> okay, the next one here, unless you're lucky enough to still have a car after your landlord evicts you. This past year, the number of evictions has skyrocketed, okay? Over 2,000 people were evicted this past year, despite moratorium, despite FEMA money, despite any kind of federal assistance, despite era dollar, despite, because landlords are allowed to do and can do and technically have a right to use their apartments and their real estate however they choose. And we've seen mostly rent increases about 400 bucks. For people who are living on a fixed income or social security or disability or whatever, you get a $400 a month increase in rent, you can't pay it. Next thing you know, it's see you bye. Happens all the time. 2,200 people on the street got, ev got evicted and a lot of them are these people like this. These two people are living in their car. The one on the left there, she's been in that car how long? About seven months? Seven months. It's, it's literally, I mean, you can't move in there. And the other one, she's always in the street always because she has no money and no place to go. And then there's another piece that I want to share with you. This is what we did last year and count. Okay, if you look at this counting, these are the other people that Kylie's talking about. These are not doubled up. Okay, you cannot be counted if you're doubled up. If you're living with somebody else, they call it as you know very well, couch surfing, you cannot be counted in these numbers. The only people who are counted in these numbers are two places. If you are at the Hope for Family Center, which is an emergency shelter, or at, um, what's the one in Martin County? Samar Compassion House in a bed, then you can be counted as homeless. If you're in a hotel, it's the other place. If you're, and it has to be paid for, by somebody else. In other words, you cannot be the one paying for it because you are not counted as homeless under those circumstances. So if you look, you'll see, unfortunately, okay, the numbers kind of run together. If you look at the number of actually number that are 
consistently homeless, you see. Indian River and St. Lucie has, you know, not a whole lot of difference. Kids, these are kids on the street. These are kids that you go to Walmart at five o'clock in the morning and they're sleeping in the car with mom so that just like Kylie said, they wanna get them to school on time and they need to be cleaned up and they need to have something to eat. And so the kids and the moms and the kids are literally sleeping in a parking lot somewhere. The point in time count consistently every year turns up moms and kids and dads and moms and kids and grandmas and kids in cars outside of Walmart. They are literally homeless, okay? Because they have no place to go and they don't have any money. Number of veterans has remained relatively consistent, okay, that are homeless veterans. And I can answer those questions anytime you want, okay? But that's a whole nother story in terms of reluctance just to come forward, to be identified. So if you look in the last column, you see where it says no shelter is available? There is not a bed for any one of these people. There are no options. There is no shelter. There is no place to put them because they're full. I mean, they're full. I mean, Compassion House, it's got what, 43 beds total? Homeless Family Center has 105. The end. The end. That's it, okay? That's all there is. So it's not easy to, um, find a place. And I, I showed you this today because this population that you see now has been slowly emerging. Women who have been disenfranchised for one reason or the other, they lost a spouse, they didn't work and never got social security until it was too late, or they only got very little, or they have a disability, so they get $824 a month. Back in the day, and I can talk back in the day because I've been around 20 years. Back in the day, you could kind of almost, if it was you and somebody else, kind of a grand from this one and 800 from that one, you could kind of almost make it, kind of almost. You had to use all of the opportunities that are available in the community technically, you know, like food and all that other stuff and food stamps. And that's all changed dramatically, number one. And number two, I just paid $4.79 for half a gallon of milk the other day. So I just wanted you to see these. I'm really basically done, okay? Because I wanted to show you the new faces of homelessness. These women and, and men, okay, are not what Joe Average thinks of, you know, when you see a guy in the street with pulling a cart. You know, these are people who are unable to secure housing or keep housing because A, they don't make enough money. The end, that's nothing else. And yes, they also can't afford most of the medical services that they might need or might get, because again, they don't have any insurance. And hospitals are technically not supposed to discharge people into homelessness. And prisons are not allowed to discharge people into homelessness. And all sorts of other rules exist. The McKinney Vento rules exist. But the, that's the reality of the situation. And we're out, I'm not out there. David is out there every day. My others, I don't work at Treasure Coast Homeless Services any longer. I retired December 31st, just telling you that. But the staff is out there, outreach staff. We just did a count this year again. And I guarantee you the numbers are the same. And basically, I just wanted you to see, this is a population for which there is nothing out there. And it's a problem. I, I wish I knew what to do. And, I would, and I'm not asking anybody for anything, but I don't have the answer. And I don't know anybody who does, but it occurs to me that there's a collaborative that's established where everybody who really cares wants to do something and works together, you know, it's not even always about money. Because I couldn't get one of these people in with a, a landlord today if I wanted to. Because landlords want credit checks, background screening. In, in a lot of cases, you know, they want three and four months worth of rent just to move into a place. And the rent's 1200 is nothing. You can't even get a, a doghouse for that anymore, you know. So 
technically, I, I'm not going to take up anybody else's time, but um, I wanted this to be different, and I wanted you to see who's out there. That is not the guy that's walking up the street talking to himself. I mean, they're there too. I will not deny their existence. But I'm saying that I think we need to think about this situation because it's not going to get better. Because these people can't get a job, can't increase their income, will never be able to be in a position to do what you think people should do to get out of homelessness. Okay, that's pretty much it. Thank you. Those of you who are familiar with Healthy You know that that session was probably um, the very theme of Healthy You. And that is, I have long held that once you put a face to the name of the um, mental health challenge that you have in front of you, um, people listen, people will, will you know, you, you raise awareness to the issue by putting, putting a, a, a face to the, to the name of the challenge. But um, next to close us out, um, for the night, I would like to offer up Carol Roberts, the Community Resource Development Agent, brings to St. Lucie County Extension a background from the public service sector and successful experience as an entrepreneur. While working full time for St. Lucie County government, she earned her BS degree from the University of Florida in food and resource economics slash agri agribusiness and went on to become an extension manager slash program specialist for St. Lucie County, focusing on financial education topics for the community. She and her partner were able to sell the, her business, um, let me see, took the opportunity to put her knowledge and skills to use as a small business owner, turning a small coffee shop into a destination location in an up and coming downtown area on the outskirts of Columbus, Ohio. She and her partner were able to sell the business and live for a year in the USVI exploring the challenges of restaurant ownership on a small Caribbean island. How interesting. Upon returning stateside, Carol worked in the insurance industry and earned her Florida Professional Customer Service Representative Insurance License before returning to the University of Florida slash IFAS Extension and St. Lucie County in 2017 as an extension agent. She offers a wide variety of programs focused on consumer topics and finance and works with community partners to address financial stability, housing, water quality, and entrepreneurship. Without further ado, Ms. Carol Roberts. Hi, everyone. Thank you. I'm short, so let me fix this a little bit. There. All right. <laughs> So these amazing ladies that you've heard from deal directly with the homeless population and I have to give them a round of applause because that is a tough task. And I, I have it easy. I am with the University of Florida Extension Service and I get to focus on resources to help people possibly avoid homelessness or how to uh, overcome it. So. Um, before I get started on how I do that, just to raise a hand, anybody here familiar with your county extension service? All right, a couple of hands, yay! So I, that, 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 depending on the number of hands, it, it means how fast I'll go through these next few slides. Um, and the trackball? Ah. Oops. In the middle of the slide. And, Okay, so the extension service is a federal program that's been around for more than 100 years, your tax dollars pay for it so if you're not taking advantage of your extension service, you are you're all leaving money on the table actually so uh, what uh, it began a long time ago because our our federal legislators said all these university researchers are doing some great work but how do we get the information that they're developing and finding out to the farmers who need to grow more food for people and that's where extension started but then it grew from there um it through every state in the nation and uh focusing on um 
starting with agriculture and then they started saying well okay so but what about the farmer's wife and the farmer's kids How, what do we what can we help them with learning about nutrition and and child care and um uh and uh, mental health issues and things like that. So they started focusing on a topic called family and consumer sciences. And there's uh, agents, extension agents across the nation and, and in our uh, throughout the state of Florida that focus on natural resources, marine environments, gardening. If you garden, we uh, you might be familiar with the Master Gardener program and and how they help people to grow their green thumb. So that's where, what Extension does. And just recently, in the last few years, um, we have expanded into other areas. So um, here in the, in the state of Florida, Cooperative Extension is a, is a, a partnership between the USDA, the state of Florida, and specifically each county government. Um, and, and it's uh, part, administered by not just the University of Florida, but the Florida and A&M University. And what we do is all we do is provide research based non biased information that helps people make better decisions. So we feel like with knowledge is power. We want to help get the information out to people to make better decisions, and, and not just the adults, but youth as well. If you're familiar with the 4-H 4-H uh, program, it's not just raising animals; it's creating future leaders through through uh, experiential activities and things. So, extension is an anomaly that not many people have heard of, but uh, we are a great resource. And it's, I want you to, to remember that you can take advantage of your county extension office by phone, by email, uh, go into our website, and we have a lot of a lot of information out there that people can use. So my area, let's uh, get focused, to pull it down to the local setting. Uh, my area is called community resource development, and it's a pretty new subject area for the University of Florida. And I am the first CRD extension agent in St. Lucie County. So I got to kind of create this position. And because of my back out, background in financial programs, and my connection with social agencies through the Council of Social Agencies, I focus on financial stability, economic um, stability and helping to improve the local economy through people better managing their money or improving their job skills or starting their own small business and start, you know, uh, creating jobs in the area. So um, that's kind of my, what I do in a nutshell. And um, so for the um, the finance and consumer education topics, um, I have a series of programs that I work with community partners to offer. I've tried doing just general programs to the public for the public on how to create a spending plan or what, how do you manage your credit score to make sure it's as golden as possible and you can qualify for the lowest interest rates and save a lot of money. Um, I don't get a lot of attendance at programs like that. I think there's a stigma that people uh, might not know everything that they they should know or feel like they should know about their money. So. A lot of the work I do is through community partners that allow me to come in and work with their their uh, organization members, or um, I offer virtual programs where people can watch uh, an educational topic, learn about it, and, and learn on their own. So we try to uh, meet people where they are with these programs on different topics. Um, so those are the fi financial life skills classes. I've worked with our area utilities to offer um, home energy savings classes, how to lower your electric and water bills so you can keep more of your money in your pocket for other important things like groceries instead of paying for, for a $400 electric bill. Uh, you know, there's ways that we can shave things down and be more efficient uh, with our with our funds. Um, I w actually got to partner with St. Lucie County for a credit score improvement grant, where if someone came to one of my programs at the library on how to manage their, uh, how, to, how to create a spending plan, it qualified them to have a one-on-one -on -one credit review. We looked at their credit report, and if they had an outstanding debt, 
that we could pay that would help improve their credit score, the grant paid it. $500. And they learned how to work with debt collectors so that if they had other outstanding debts that were holding them back financially, they knew how to, to take care of those debts one at a time and become get in a better financially stable place so that they could look at it, their money in a different way. But you know, it takes it's it's a stepping, it's a step-by-step -step process to get there. Um, I've offered a money money management boot camp at the United Against Poverty, and that was pretty well attended. So anytime I can get in front of audiences and help them understand maybe if there could be a way to to improve your financial situation, I'd I'd love to. So that uh, that's my pitch on on you know use your extension service and use your county county uh, community resource development agent for financial education. Uh, besides that, I um, help encourage small business growth because you know that's the backbone of this country is small business, and a lot of people have an idea. Of, of a business they want to do, but they're not really sure how to get started. So I kind of go through and direct them and licensing and, and uh, record keeping, how to be prepared for the taxes that they'll owe, uh, and little things like that that not everybody understands when they have this great idea to start a business. All those business chores are not really why they're starting a business, but they're necessary to be able to stay in business. So that's where I come in. And I've worked with uh, veterans and agriculture groups to help them understand how to start small businesses. I focus on landscape maintenance um, interests who want to get started with a lawn service business, one of the easiest ways to get started in business. And, and one of the easiest ways for maybe some of our returning citizens to get employed is to start their own business. And a lot of times they face challenges with their, their backgrounds that prevent them from getting employment. And if they can find a way to start their own business, they can maybe become financially stable and be part of the economy. Um, so that's a little bit about what I do with, the, with finances. And then the fun part of my job, I don't focus on too much, but it is a fun part. I get to help people talk about issues. So uh, there's a lot of issues that are going on and not everybody is, is, feels like they can share their opinions. So I've been trained as a facilitator to help guide deliberative dialogue discussions so that people can come together in a group and share their thoughts in a, in a um, open and non-threatening way so that, they're, that, that we can move forward and maybe come together with ideas that can improve our, our local area. So uh, such as the, uh, the COSA Affordable Housing Retreat. As a member of COSA, I heard a lot of the social agencies voicing their concerns with their, their program participants. Maybe it wasn't an, an organization like, like Louise's that deals specifically with homeless. Maybe it's a domestic violence situation but their clientele are are facing a, a lack of housing and it's impacting those social agencies so we got together and talked about what we could do as a group of social agencies to help alleviate that or or what could we address together so those kind of things that that help move the conversation forward is the, like I said the fun part of my job um, so if it, if there is a way that extension can help you to, uh, to get a better handle on your finances, somebody you know might need some advice on how to get that, per that improve their credit score so life costs them less and they could afford the other things they need to, to, to have, then take advantage of your extension office and, and your community resource development agent for that. And that, that was a mouthful really fast. <laughs> <laughs> But thank you.